Well, tonight I'm going to try to go over as much stuff as I can. I, I'm going to use my cards because we haven't done this program since COVID hit. So uh, it's glad that we're back again. And uh, first question I have, how many has been through this program before? Anybody? Well, my wife's in the back there. Uh, <laughs> she has. Uh, we will be passing uh, items around. So we're going to start at this end, and it'll go this way and keep going back. Then she'll gather, gather them up. Because one of the things I like to do is have people handle things. And with some of the programs I do, I am going to add a few things. I'm going to add a little bit on evolution. And the reason why is I want you guys to handle the oldest tool that I have that we know of that was made by a human being. And so, and it's 1.7 million years old. And so uh, that's why I like to handle, uh, hand things around. So that's why I like to deal a little bit with, with evolution, a little bit with climate, because we know climate has affected the human race since the very, very, very beginning. Uh, the handouts, as I, I, I'll try to go over them as we go. Uh, normally, I have a PowerPoint presentation, but my flash drive is possessed. I have no idea what's going on with it. <laughs> so you guys luck out. You get a lot of handouts. Uh, so we'll try to go over that. So real quickly, the first one is our membership application. I, I wouldn't be president if I didn't at least include that. Uh, we are also part of the Society for Pennsylvania Archaeology. Uh, they are statewide. Uh, like I said, we're chapter 26, but they don't have 26 chapters anymore. Uh, mainly because it's hard to keep organizations together. And they usually meet once a year in April. They have a convention. And if you join, they do have a publication that comes out uh, two times a year. And it's basically on historic or prehistoric archaeology, mostly in Pennsylvania, but sometimes neighboring states. All depends where, the, where, where a chapter may be uh, located. Uh, we meet uh, from March through November. Uh, it's the second Thursday of the month. Uh, at my place, and the address is in, the, in there. And you don't have to join to come. Uh, but we do cancel our meeting in August because we have a picnic, and we cancel in, in October because we have a banquet. And if you do show up on, in May, it is the third Thursday of the month. It'll be at the Fort LaBeouf Museum. I can't make it, but Dr. Gramley's coming in. He's a wonderful archaeologist from uh, Massachusetts, and he's going to be talking about, probably talking about the Blue Lick site, and I'll get that in a little bit. Because we, we are changing the way we look at how Native Americans hunted mammoths and mastodonts. We, know, we now know it's more uh, related with what they're doing in Europe. Matter of fact, our archaeologists have missed it. But if Russians or people from Denmark or Sweden came here to dig, they would have recognized it in a heartbeat. And so it's, it's very exciting. So almost every archaeologist now who's ever dug an elephant has got to go back and look at their skeleton to see if it's been butchered. And so it is very, very interesting. Uh, my program, I call it the Original People, a Stone Age uh, Culture. And the reason why I'm going to begin with, with uh, fossils, well, not fossils, uh, uh, evolution first is because when we talk about humans, like I said, as soon as a human comes on board, there's stone tools. And it's, it's amazing how they, in a short period of time, how the technology evolves that it's uh, uh, just amazing to see it. When, and when you understand the number that they made, it's mind blowing. Uh, Homo erectus hand tools aren't rare. They are a dime a dozen. They are everywhere. And, are, and they made them by the millions. And we still can't figure out why. <laughs> I mean, it, it's very interesting. Uh, so be, I'm going to begin with uh, a couple statements on history. Uh, the thing is, if we don't know our history, we have, there's a, a, an issue there. because we're, we're finding that it's changing. Uh, there's been a conscious effort since about 1889 to, to change our history, and it's been nonstop. And so it's always good to study, especially books, because I, I've learned with some, doing some programs that you can't depend on the internet to give you the right information all the time. So uh, books are always good. And so one of the things I'd like to begin with is Edmund Burke. He was one of our founding fathers, and everybody's probably have heard this statement. Those who don't know history are destined to repeat it. And, uh, and that is true. And sometimes we can make some stupid mistakes if we do not know our history. And Abraham Lincoln wrote, and you'll probably understand this very easily uh, when you think it's going on today. The things that are taught in our schools in this generation will be the policies of our government in the next generation. So history is very, very important. Uh, and that's why I like to begin with a little bit on evolution. Uh, Charles Darwin, I was a, uh, in his day, he would be a genius. Today, he'd be a well-learned individual. If you look at his equipment back then, uh, the microscopes that he had, the technology, today it's kindergarten. 
uh, based on what we have. And so we're taking somebody from 1850s and trying to put him up into the 20th, 21st century, and we can't do it. And a lot of people don't realize that in his book, chapter six says, problems with the theory. He had questions. And so one of the things he wrote, I think on your uh, handouts, uh, one of the first ones is the time chart. I always include that because we find that almost everybody likes fossils or looking into geology. And so this gives you the time periods uh, through the, through the uh, formation of the Earth. And if you look at the very top, we're in the Holocene. So we're at the very top. Uh, there will be another uh, one on there. It says the first humans. Uh, the bottom of that page is uh, Darwin. And then about two pages over, you'll see a family tree of, uh, hu of the human race. But uh, with Darwin, for example, uh, when he was looking at the problems, one of the things he wrote, if it can be demonstrated that any complex organ existed which could not possibly have been formed by numerous successive slight modifications, my theory would absolutely break down. But I can find no such case. Now, the problem was, when he looked at a cell, he could only see, and he could see a, all he could see is a simple cell. Today, we can go into the nucleus and keep going down and down and down. As one scientist put it, it's machines upon machines upon machines upon machines all working by themselves. Darwin couldn't see that. And so if he was alive today, he would not come up with this theory because everything, as we know, when we go to the doctors, everything is very complex when it comes to the human uh, body. And I do got to read his book again because I'm curious to see what he uh, talks about plants. Uh, an archaeological dig I went out to in New Mexico. Uh, I spent the first night at Albuquerque. And I got my last good shower in about seven days. And uh, when I got out, there's a, there a program on seeds. And usually after about 3 o'clock, we could go out into the desert and, and then go look for relics. And it just so happens one of the seeds that was on the program was this. It's called the Devil's Claw. And when I found it, I knew exactly what it was. What it was. So I carried it like this because uh, I didn't want to break it. And when I went by a bush, it actually hooked, and it demonstrated exactly what it's supposed to do. When the pod grows, little tentacles come out, and they get razor sharp. It actually stuck in my skin and drew blood on both sides. This is an animal leg hold trap. Uh, it's a bean that grows on the ground on game trails. And it waits for an animal's hoof or paw to go through it. And as he goes forward, it digs in. The, it, the animal is irritated. He snaps it off. The pod splits open and drops the seed. And as the animal is walking down the game trail, it deposits the rest of the seeds. And so when you think of, are plants intelligent enough to be able to form something that they need an animal for? And the other one, uh, I can show you a picture. This is a melon, and we know most melons grow on the surface. This one does not. It's a melon. And so when it grows, a little tentacle comes out, heads toward the ground, and starts to burrow. And this forms about 12, 12 inches underground. And so for a melon who wants to survive, this is not the way to survive. And we call it the aardvark melon, because the aardvark is the only animal on Earth that can find it. He can smell it. He digs down. He eats it. And it goes through the digestive system. The seed has to go through a digestive system to break down the outer shell. And then it gets secreted out. Problem is, the seed can't grow. It's got to be buried. An aardvark, like a cat, buries his feces. So there's no way a melon can make a, a, a decision or any plant that it needs an animal. Because how does it know the animal's even there? So studying evolution, it was always neat. So I have to go back through and read Darwin's book. And I'm curious to see what he says about plants. Now climate, uh, I get into that a little bit because we know climate has affected uh, the human race for a long period of time. I have one chart in there, which we'll get to in a second. It's uh, a map of Florida. Uh, if you study Homo erectus, that, that, to me, that's, that sucker should have his, his name changed because he has been everywhere. We find, he, we find him on, on islands. Uh, he's all over Africa, all over Asia, all over the Middle East, all through Europe. But he never made it north and because the current ice age was just beginning. And so if it wasn't for the ice age, we would, have, we would find Homo erectus here. 
So it's a weather that kept him away. We also know that uh, weather affected Neanderthals. Uh, it started their decline. And then once their numbers decreased, uh, out of Africa was, was coming a new race of humans. Basically, we call modern Homo sapiens or advanced Homo erectus. The two met, and the outcome was Neanderthal gets bred out of existence. And so there's a certain percentage of Europeans that still have Neanderthal D DNA. So we do know they didn't go extinct. OK. <laughs> I swear my ag teacher was a Neanderthal. If I, but, uh, uh, so we know they didn't disappear. They just basically were bred out of existence. And, and, and that's what basically happened to them. When you look at the map of Florida, uh, you see the white. I'm going to pass two fossils around, too, first. This is a horse tooth from uh, north, the surf at North Myrtle Beach in South Carolina. These are sun bleached seashells uh, from Anglewood, Florida, uh, part of road construction. This is actually Florida's gravel, but look at the age of them. You, you swear they just came out of the ocean. Now, if you look at the, the, uh, the white part of Florida, if you look below that, that, that's water. That's where these shells come from. About a million years ago, the uh, ice started to form. And if you look at the, the outer line, that's how big Florida actually got. It's, it was twice the size that it is today. And it was estimated that in Canada, the ice sheet was two miles thick. That's a lot of water. And the northern part of the Gulf of Mexico was a grassland. And that's where the Ice Age animals that Florida is noted for came from. They actually walked from Mexico, uh, Central America, South America to Florida. The horse tooth that I found, uh, if I was standing there uh, at the peak of the Ice Age, I could not see the ocean. That's how much dry ground there was. The Chesapeake Bay was dry ground because we know that because we find Indian relics uh, in the middle of the, in the, middle of the uh, Chesapeake Bay. So we know that was dry, dry ground. If you look at the inner line, that's Florida today. So there's still some, some land missing. Uh, now what's going to happen is a uh, recent program was talking about Greenland. If all the ice in Greenland melts, the ocean's raised 23 feet. Iceland has Ice Age ice. Some parts of the planet still have million-year-old ice on it. And the reason why we know it, the scientists we don't hear from, they still drill into it to study greenhouse gases to see what was going on back then. When you look at the current research today, it is from the Industrial Revolution forward. And the reason why is late 1700s, they started using coal. Late 1800s, they started using gas, oil, and electricity. They can't take in the entire, uh, let's say, Industrial Revolution, because from 1400 to about 1850, we were going through a mini ice age. Uh, the world changed. Uh, there was mass starvations. Governments changed. Uh, one of the last plagues was probably the cause of that. And it was probably three major volcanoes that happened way back when. And we do know the sun was a part of the problem. And uh, the interesting thing is, from 1880 to today, the Earth has is, is climbed only two degrees. Native Americans would be laughing at us, because we know that they had uh, Temperatures were far hotter than we have today. We know they had it far colder than we have today because they, 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 they lived through part of the Ice Age. They had drier spells and they had weather spells. And so did the rest of the world. And so the interesting thing is, I, I knew about 40 years ago from picking up these fossils that not even hearing about the climate, that I knew that the, uh, once the water gets back up to about Orlando, the last Ice Age is over, and the sixth Ice Age will begin. We've already had five. And so studying climate is very interesting. And when it comes to archaeology, what's kind of nice about that too, if you have a good, clean site, especially a rock shelter, you can go in and do flotation. Now, what, a lot of times what you can gather, what floats to the surface is pollen and small seeds. And from that, archaeologists know what the temperature and the climate was like back then. So that's how we know that Native Americans went through far worse than we ever did. OK, uh, I think your next three handouts deal with, with times. 
a lot of times if you look at the different, the different ages, you'll see that but one page you might see one, one set of dates, but on another page you might see a different set. It's not that it's wrong. It all depends on the archaeologist who put the information together. And the reason we say that, if you're doing, an, uh, let's say, an archaic excavation in, uh, near the Maryland border, you could be definitely digging an archaic site. But if you're up in New York digging, uh, same, uh, the same time period, you might have a, a Clovis site. Uh, it all depends what's going on. The closer you are to rivers, uh, the more advanced you start to get. If you stay in the, uh, we'll say, the wilderness, you're still going to keep the same traits you had from the very beginning. So you could have two different time periods at the same time. It just depends where you are in the country when you're, when you're doing your dig. Because there for a while, as the glaciers kept melting back into Canada, the people we call Clovis just kept following them, and they did not get rid of their traditions until the ice was finally gone, the big game herds changed, they started to change. Then there's a time when they're all doing basically the same thing at the exact same, same time. So for Pennsylvania, mostly what we do is, uh, there is a pre, we call it a pre-paleo, but I think we're starting to get rid of that to a point. So we have paleo or Clovis, that goes from 14,000 BC to 8,000 BC. The archaic, some, some archaeologists break it down into early, middle, late. I think there's, there might be just a middle, late. And that goes from 8,000 BC to 1,800 BC. Pennsylvania has a transitional period, as we call it, or terminal or archaic. And that runs from about 1800 BC to 1200 BC. And that's when a lot of the tribes started to move toward the river systems. And major trading was going on. And villages are now starting to become more permanent. But these people were doing very specific things for a very short period of time, and then all of a sudden it stopped. And they, and they went into woodland period. Uh, woodland is broken down into, for our area, we can easily break it down into three different time periods. Uh, early woodland would be 1200 uh, BC to 500 BC. But if you're familiar with the mound people, the Adena were uh, in power at that time, especially in Ohio, and they influenced our part of Pennsylvania. Middle woodland would be 500 BC to 800 AD. But by this time, the Hopewell take over. And so they're the other mound people. And they also influenced our, our area. When you get to late woodland, that's 800 AD to 1550 AD. Uh, we just simply call it late prehistoric. Now, if you lived closer to the Mississippi, then the Mississippian mound culture takes over. So they, they become the, 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 the dominant people. Uh, we probably didn't see any trade influence with them, but I, I would guess that the closer you get toward the Chesapeake Bay, they would have had trading uh, with the Mississippians. Then historic period, 1500 AD, or 1550 AD to 1780. I picked 1780 only because I think by that time there were no more major Indian settlements in, Pens uh, in Pennsylvania. They've all been removed. Now there's still incursions, there's still war going on up until the uh, War of 1812, but, but, but by 1780 there, there are no more vi real villages. If they are, they're out this way and they're slowly but surely being pushed into, in, into Ohio. Now we're going to get into some uh, tool technology. Uh, like I said, when humans first set foot on the planet, all of a sudden they were making tools. Uh, one of the interesting things is when you look at the, t the, the, the family tree that's uh, uh, in one of the handouts, uh, you'll see anywhere you see the word homo, that is a human. When you look at the other names, they are the great apes. And if you look at the branch, there is always a break. They're not connected. And the interesting thing is with the great apes, the Smithsonian still has one of the great apes holding a bone tool. Uh, the problem is that was old research. But if you continue down and scroll down, uh, if you didn't do that, you'd miss the rest of the story. Uh, new research has come out because uh, when they found the skeleton, they found broken bones near him. And so they figured they were tools. Well, now they know through new research that these broken tools are not tools. They're Shattered bones done by lions, hyenas from the time period. And so that's new research, which helps a lot of archaeologists because there is an a, uh, art to, to studying bones and knowing uh, who killed the animal. And it's an amazing study. It's just, uh, it, they can even tell if a fox scratched it, which is, I, I can't figure that out, but they could tell. But what they, then they tell you, near the great ape, there's a human. 
and near him there are stone tools. But they won't say they're his. <laughs> but we do know that they were making tools. Now I'm going to send this one around. It don't look like much. Uh, but this is the oldest stone tool that we know of made by humans. It's from Ethiopia. It is, uh, there's a World Heritage Site there, and a friend of mine from Denmark has now passed away. Uh, he went there to visit. And so when he was done, he went out and asked the Ethiopians if there was any place to hunt tools. And they just laughed at him and said, well, you see their fence? It goes that way, five miles. And so he went and gathered. When I saw him at Tucson, this is the only one he had left. So I'm glad because this is the oldest tool you will ever handle as of right now. This is a better one. Uh, this is from another location in uh, Africa. This is, uh, they call it an Oluan uh, chopper. We don't think they're choppers. My archaeologist friend, Mike Gramley, thinks they're weapons. If you hold it like this, all Aboriginal people are wonderful at hitting things. I don't care what the distance is. If they're going to throw something, they're going to hit you with it. And it can be deadly. So when you feel this one, the cutting edge, just think of this flying through the air, and it hits you in the head. And so these people would not have had spears or bows and arrows. And so if they came across a kill, and there's lions there or hyenas there, they just start plump, uh, throwing these. And more than likely, they can, if they hit a lion right, they're going to kill him. And so they're, they're, they're wonderful weapons. Now, what got me started in uh, collecting this kind of uh, early man tools, because I have stuff uh, from Africa all the way through Europe up to Neolithic, is this. When I was at Tucson, I was in a Moroccan uh, shop, and there was an old box on the floor with some rocks in it. And I saw that this, there was a tool there, so I picked it up. Couldn't figure out what it was, but there was a professor friend of mine with me from Mercyhurst, so I asked him, what is this? He says, Oh, has a homo erectus stone, stone axe. I said, no. He said, yes. <laughs> and uh, so I asked the Moroccans, and I always like Moroccans, very, very old. I said, OK, how much? $8. I said, OK. <laughs> <laughs> so it's a, this is uh, probably with their first style, uh, probably about 700,000 years old. And in a relatively very, very short period of time, their technology got better. Now they're really. Uh, flaking these, they're shaping these things. And this one, if you take notice, there's a flake taken out on top. It's for the thumb. With these, you'll, uh, this, we know this Homo erectus was right-handed. We do find some. We know the guy was left-handed. And what I find interesting is I think through all cultures, no, nobody will say it's, the uh, it's a fact or not. If mom and dad had a hand axe, junior had to have a hand axe. And so in almost every culture, we find miniatures. And so the only reason why I can think of miniatures is either a specific tool type or the kids have to learn what mom and dad have already know. Now, we do know that Homo erectus and all his ancestors left Africa headed toward Europe. But somewhere along the line, we're just, I don't think they're really sure where Neanderthal came from. He's starting to work toward, oh, and I will take the sand axes going around. We'll find these in Native American cultures, too. If the tool works, it's, it continues to be used through the ages. And it, doesn't, it never disappears. And so the Africans kept using it up, to, to, up until the Neolithic. But it just continued all through Europe. Now, you know, uh, Neanderthal was working his way toward Africa. The last skeleton we know of was found in Israel. But the technology keeps going. So we do know that they're trading uh, tools and stuff back and forth, or the two groups are meeting and are exchanging technology. This is a Neanderthal hand axe. And we still we find these type here in North America, too. We know our Clovis people had hand axes like this. It actually is a, it's a wonderful cutting tool. It's uh, wonderful for chopping through bone, uh, meat, uh, whatever you want. It works fantastic. And again, right here is a flake taken out for the thumb. 
And so, but this, I think this one could be multi-use, depending what left or right. Now, uh, in Africa and in Europe, it's the same technology. We find the same style blades in both areas. Uh, so it looks like they're, they were trading technology. Uh, they're the exact same size. Uh, the material almost looks the same. They're all wonderfully made. But today, if we found one of these in North America, it would be a cash blade or something that the Native Americans would make to carry with them if we eventually make an arrowhead or a spear or a knife out of. And so the style, the technique has not changed in, in 80,000 years. Now in Africa, matter of fact, meteorite hunters actually start running into these things. Uh, they are projectile points. If you watch new movies or specials on Neanderthal, if you look at their spears, they are now uh, flint tipped before they were just bone, I mean, or just, just wood. Uh, these are the first half of tools uh, that we know of uh, made by either advanced Homo erectus or by Neanderthal. But the technology was going back and forth from Europe into Africa. And in Africa, we find these, they find these by the thousands sometimes. Uh, but they are the first half of projectile point. In Europe, they're they are far more, now the date on that frame going around is wrong. It should be uh, raised to about a minimum of about uh, 50,000 years. But this is one from Europe. It's called a pick, but we th I think it's a hafted spear because these, these guys were going into caves, driving out cave bears. And so you want something that you can push it, something the size of a polar bear out of the cave. And so uh, they weren't going to go in there with something dull. So we know the dirt points were far more effective. Uh, but we still don't think they're killing animals with them because they don't, they don't have the thinness to actually do the job. But we do know they were pushing and shoving because most uh, Neanderthal skeletons have breaks in them that are the same that uh, rodeo cowboys get. So we know that they're getting up close and personal with, their, with what they're hunting. But there is a possibility When you see a point like this, was Neanderthal experimenting with the bow and arrow? Hmm. Even though it might have been 50 or 80,000 years ago, we do know that technology uh, comes and all of a sudden disappears. And so it would be interesting to know uh, when you look at the sharpness that's going around, and when you look at the polish on a lot of these things, the polish is from being in the sand for a long, long time, constantly being sandblasted. One of the things that I find uh, interesting is if one culture invents something, the other cultures also invent something, even though they're separated by an ocean. These are celts or axes. This celt is from Crawford County, Pennsylvania. This celt is from Africa. Same thing. If I took this and dropped it in Africa, they wouldn't be able to tell it apart. If I took this and threw it in a field in Crawford County, they would not even know it's not from Crawford County. Made the same way, we even find these on isolated islands. And so whoever, we think in, in all cultures, there are geniuses. And when, when they need a tool, they're inventing it. And they're inventing it all over the world. So uh, this one, that has, uh, it's got a, a break taken out of it. That's the one from Africa. Okay, this is a chopper. This is a wonderful tool that probably all Native American groups use from Clovis all the way up through the woodland. Uh, this is from Montgomery County. This is quartzite. This is a chopper made by Homo erectus. And so it's about 500,000 years old. Basically the same design. Every culture in the world uses choppers. Some of them are made out of heavy shell 
or stone. A tool works. You keep it. But it's interesting to see that cultures separated by 500,000 years will invent the same thing and keep the same thing going. These we call Columbia River gem points. These are actually very poor quality. Uh, but they're called gem points because it's gem quality material that, that these uh, Native Americans were making their points from. And they're from river systems. And they're always from major river systems. These should be called Saharan or African gem points. They are found by the thousands along river systems. So whatever the Native Americans were doing in Washington and Oregon, the Africans in Africa were doing the exact same thing along major river systems. And you could take these points and mix them up, mix them up and I would even challenge most uh, experts to separate them. Very hard to do. When you see the ones with the big ears like this uh, coming down, uh, even though I don't have one in here, uh, the Indians up in Oregon and Washington made the exact same thing almost identical. One of the problems we sometimes have with, with putting dates or uh, an age with a point is when they're made, uh, they're gorgeous. But once they start being used and they start getting sharpened down, they change. And a lot of times, we, we'll name a point uh, by its base, because a lot of the bases are different. But a lot of times, it changes. But to give you an idea how things change, uh, this is a Susquehanna broad point. Uh, most likely, they're, most likely, uh, they're all, almost always concentrated in and around the Susquehanna River. As it gets sharpened down, it actually can be turned into a drill for drilling, for making holes. If the drill breaks, they can refinish it and make a scraper out of it. Now, the problem is when you get to the scraper part, it's hard to tell which culture made it. It's only because I found it on a Susquehanna site that I know it's Susquehannan. And so this will give you an idea how a point changes through time. But a lot of times, if they want a scraper or if they want to drill, they'll make it uh, deliberately, too. So I, I, I will send this around. Uh, this is, uh, when we look at the Susquehanna Broad Point, you go next to it, there's a drill. This drill was specifically made to be a drill. This is a T-drill, but we do not know sometimes the cultures that, who made it. Uh, we have to find it with other point types so we know basically who made it. Uh, so they did make them for actually drilling, and I will show you in a second. Mm -hmm. Drills are always hafted. Uh, some are huge, and they are used for the hand, by hand. Uh, one like this could be used with a, a bow drill. It could be used with a, it's kind of a, 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 a drill you could put in your mouth. It's, it's also uh, it's a, like a pump drill. Or you can do it by hand. Now, this is steatite soapstone. I can, you could drill through this in about, probably about a half hour. But drills are all sharp. They're shelf sharp sharpening. And so it doesn't take much that you, that you can drill through. So I, most people say they, uh, they, they don't see any wear on these. And the only reason why they don't see any wear on them, they resharpen themselves as they're going. And so they're always sharp. And even the experts missed that because they couldn't figure out why some were so perfect. They're not perfect. They just uh, can't tell that they were being used. So it is a wonderful tool. It, they can drill soft stone, uh, wood. Uh, a lot of times they're, they're used for making fish wares. Uh, some of the words had to be strong enough to catch sturgeon, and they were catching sturgeon in French Creek at one time. And the scrapers, uh, oh. Scrapers also, they had to make large ones specifically because when you're working with an elk hide, bear hide, you want something more he uh, hefty to scrape with. Uh, they're also used for uh, shaping wood, uh, scraping bones, so there's all sorts of things they can use them for. 
And again, they would be hafted so that you can actually uh, use them. Vast majority of all scrapers are made from broken projectile points. And this little one over here, we don't know. It's possible that if mom and dad are scraping a the hide, they're going to make a little, little scraper for Junior so he can sit there and scrape along with, along with mom and dad. And just to give you an idea what points are capable of, this is a small projectile point from a bison kill site. This, this projectile point will kill a buffalo with one shot. It's very small, but when you're on horseback, uh, a, lot of, a lot of animals cannot back up unless they're trained. And so they come in on horseback very close to the bison. Their bows are short, very powerful. The, the, the arrows are short. And so they're almost point blank when they let go. And so th this is going to drive deeply right into the heart. And it does kill bison. So it's, you, you can't look at a, judge a point by its size because we know what they're capable of doing. Now, when you look at the points that are up here, what's the common name we have for them? What's, what do people call them usually? Arrowheads. Arrowheads. OK, if you go from this frame here, some of them are basically arrowheads. But everything else going down are either spears or knives. The smallest points you see in there is a spear. And so if mom and dad have a spear, <laughs> Junior's going to have a spear. Now, the difference between a knife and a spear can be a, a number of different things. I'm going to send this around. And if you look at the side closest to the tag, it is beveled just like our cutting knives are today. If, if I was to take this out on this side, which you can't see, it is also beveled. So it's almost like a Bowie knife. They're beveled usually on both sides. And this would have been twice its size when it was first made. And through resharpening as a knife, it gets smaller and smaller and smaller. Eventually, this would turn into a drill. And a lot of times, the difference between a knife and a spear is what you put it on. If you put it on a short handle, whether it's bone, antler or uh, wood, it's a, it's a knife. If you put it on a longer shaft, you have a spear. Uh, it's almost the only difference in them, especially when they're not sharpened, because you don't know what they are until you start really sharpening them. Now, some of the ways we uh, name points uh, is, is some, uh, by so, a lot of times landmarks. For example, the, the Hopewell people, uh, the first mound that was ever dug was on a farm called the Hopewell Estate. So the people are called Hopewell. Same thing with Adena. First farm that they, uh, the mound was dug in was called the Adena Estate. The people we call the Mocha. Uh, a perfect site was found at the bottom of the Mocha Lake, New York, which is one of the Finger Lakes. And the people we call Brewerton, one of their sites was dug near the town of Brewerton. Now, we probably shouldn't call them Brewerton, because by this time, the Seneca or the Haudenosaunee are now starting to form. And so more than likely, the Brewerton were uh, uh, Seneca. So that's how we, we name some of them. We also put point types uh, in, into clusters or traditions. Uh, Example would be <coughs> these long spears right here, or knives, they basically fall under what we call the Piedmont tradition. And it's mostly because they're found on the Piedmont Plateau that goes through Pennsylvania down into Maryland. So, and since they're only found kind of that general area, we call it the Piedmont tradition. <laughs> Another tradition which is very unique to Pennsylvania are these right here. It's the broad point uh, tradition. For some reason, from the eastern part of the state all the way in, into uh, eastern Ohio, a uh, certain time period, they're making these big, broad points. 
uh, but it has to do with something very specific that's going on that I'll, I'll talk to you in, in a little bit. But it's interesting that clusters or traditions show up, but then a lot of the other points just kind of, okay, they're here, they're there, but they don't show up as a tradition or a cluster. Uh, so, some of the, the collectors that wrote books, they, uh, one guy uh, that did one on the east of the Mississippi, he calls a lot of them clusters. Because he can find, when he, when he looks at large collections, not only may he find it in eastern Pennsylvania, he may also find it in Illinois. And so we know that the people traveled back and, back and forth. Matter of fact, the first point I ever found out here when I moved out this way was a Perkiomen broad point, and they are found in Lehigh County, clear the other end of the state. So we know that there's trading going on, and somebody out here decided to copy the point. So somewhere along the line, the two groups of people met. Now, I'm, I'm surprised they didn't keep their own point because the attribute broad point is gorgeous. Okay, on one of your uh, charts, there should be uh, a map showing how the people came. Uh, a couple different theories. If you look at the one on the East Coast, uh, that's, I'm thinking a little bit far-fetched, but when you think of the distance they had to travel, it's a long way, uh, coming from Europe all the way to uh, North America. The other more plausible one is the uh, uh, Siberian route, and there are enough old points in Alaska to point to that. I'm going to send around some uh, casts. <laughs> okay. These are casts. Uh, can't afford the real things. <laughs> uh, this one, if you look at it, is from Alaska. And it is roughly 11,200 years before present. So it's a very old point and it was found high, so that means the glaciers never touched it. This is called a Cactus Hill point, and it's interesting because this is from the eastern part of the state, I believe, Virginia. Yeah, Virginia. And the people who found this believe that this point type came from Europe, where this style point type may have come from Siberia. So we're, there's still a lot of research going on on that. But the one from uh, the Cactus Hill site in Virginia, one of the interesting things when we look at old sites in, in North America, the vast majority of them are in the, in, in the uh, east. And according to some records, there are 200 Clovis sites around Washington, D.C. alone. And you only have a handful out west. So it is interesting. But the west is big. They haven't found everything out there. But it, it will be interesting to see if we can come up with even older sites out that way. So they think that the, the Cactus Hill might be a Seleucian point from Europe. Uh, there is a close resemblance. This is a style of that point from Italy. Uh, so it is possible. But the problem is when you look at Seleucian points, the vast majority of Seleucian points from uh, Europe are different. Uh, there are some look like the Cactus Hill Point, but these run from anywhere from 17,000 years ago to 20,000 years ago. Uh, this is probably the onset in Europe of the bow and arrow. Uh, we think the they had the bow and arrow uh, a lot earlier there. Uh, be careful with this frame. The pins are out of it. I'm looking and figure, oh, there's no pins in it to hold it in place. So just be careful passing it around. These are some of the oldest points from Europe. Now, other things we do have, we do know that the first skeletons we have are Caucasian. They're not Native American. Uh, there's the Arlington Man from the Channel Islands off of uh, California. Uh, the, they do have to change it because the bones they found, they had them retested, and they think it should be Arlington Woman instead. She's 12,000 she's, uh, 12, years old. Uh, there's a teenager found in the cave in Mexico, an underwater cave, and she's been dated to about uh, 12,000 to 13,000 years ago. And uh, we think that they started coming across the Bering Straits about 40,000 years ago, and a lot of them would have been Caucasian. Uh, the one that's interesting, uh, there's a picture of a skull, and the meat put back on the skull, and a person underneath it. 
That's Kennewick Man from Washington. He's about 9,400 years old. Uh, the interesting thing about him, uh, he also was shot. <laughs> he had a projectile point embedded in him and it healed. The other thing that was interesting when they put the meat back on, they realized he's Japanese. It's a very ancient tribe in the mountains of Japan, and Japan doesn't like them either <laughs> for some reason. They, they really don't look Japanese, but during that time period, Japan would have been attached to the mainland. So, these, so those people have been very nomadic. And more than likely, not a lot of them came over. Or if they did, they basically, same thing. If, depending how many different groups were here, get, you, you just get bred out of existence. Uh, but we do know that Caucasians, just, uh, for whatever reason, didn't make it. Uh, the only problem with the Kennewick man, uh, I'm not sure who has the skeleton. Uh, Corps of Engineers won't let the archaeologists see the projectile point, because if we could see the projectile point, we would know what it's made out of, and we would know where he was shot at, <laughs> because we know what country he was in when he got shot. Uh, sad thing, the Corps of Engineers, the guy in charge at that time, was told, do not touch the site. He decided to protect it by dumping tons upon tons upon tons of rock on top of it, and he crushed it. Then he filled it with dirt, and then he put plants on it that the root system is so bad that the site's been destroyed forever. We have lots of stories of that. And next one is going to be, it's a Nitnachi site up in Washington, a wonderful Clovis site. A farmer found it while digging a trench. And this is what he was finding. This is a cast. These are Clovis points. Uh, we don't know what they were used for. They could have been ceremonial. Uh, but uh, they, they knew they were important, so he called the state archaeologist in. Uh, they were thrilled. And the, and the farmer, not being like any normal person, asked, are they worth anything? He got a tongue lashing, and he threw them off <laughs> the property. Uh, they treated him with disrespect. My friend, Dr. Gramley, from, from at that time New York State, got in contact with him. He gave him all the information he wanted, and the guy invited him out to dig. Archaeologists are very jealous, and they were furious. They actually got the Native Americans involved. And there's a picture of, I think, Dr. Gramley holding this one in the trench. And if you look, he is wearing a bulletproof vest. That's how nasty this, got, this gets out there. And so. When it was all said and done, they buried the site. And Mike said that these things were still sticking out of the wall. It's been capped with concrete. We do not know what happened to the relics. They might have been repatriated. Uh, the site was capped with concrete, never to be dug again. And the last group I'll, I'll show, then I'll get into. We might be getting ready for a break here shortly. Yes. The Sugarloaf Site. The Sugarloaf Site's in uh, north of uh, Springfield, Massachusetts. Beautiful area. Uh, an amateur archaeologist found it. Uh, went to do a report on it, and the state stepped in and told him, do not do that. The state came in, bought the site with a local college, and they capped it with eight feet of sand to protect it. It has not been dug in 30 years. Dr. Mike Gramley shows up <laughs> and from New York. No, oh, he's in Massachusetts at this time. And because, uh, uh, no, no, he was in New York at that time. Uh, he goes, because next door, I didn't know it, Massachusetts is noted for wonderful tobacco. <laughs> and uh, so he dug next to one of the tobacco barns. And was finding wonderful artifacts, uh, beads, other carved items that uh, you don't find with Clovis. And he did a report, and the state found out about it. They go to the farmer and say, hey, we'll give you 250 $50,000 for exclusive farm, uh, digging rights. What farmer is going to turn up free money? Which I don't blame him. The state has never dug. Uh, about, I forget what year it was. And I don't think Mike put it on here. He gets a call from Deerfield Township. He says, do you want to come up and dig? He says, we can't dig. There's no place to dig. He says, we have a 20-foot right away between the two sites. <laughs> and so we went up, and we dug in the 20-foot right away. And this was some of the points we were finding. This point was very interesting. It's, it's all done except for, for grinding. This is, this is a cast. We can see where the Indians sat to make this. And this is a dried up Pleistocene lake that they were hunting caribou. There were, there were valley caribou. The caribou trail is still there. 16,000 animals. They would stay there 
until they killed off all but about 3,000. Then they would leave. 60 years later, they would come back, and the herd would be back up to 60,000 again. They start all over again. And so we can see where this guy was sitting to make this, and it looks like he set it on the ground just like this, and it sank in the sand. That's how we found it. So he actually lost it, which is amazing. But we found lots of these. And so now there's a very nice report. The township has a wonderful collection, and, and the site is probably the largest late clover site in the east, and we'll never get dug. <laughs> We don't know. Uh, sometimes they say they're waiting for technology, but uh, the technology is not needed for there. We have a lot of information on Clovis. Uh, all this would do is add to it, because we, we, we know the material came from 100 miles away in New York, in New York State. Uh, so there's a lot we know about that time period. But what would be good to know is, were they really hunting caribou there? We found some bone, but we didn't find a lot. Uh, but it'd be neat to dig in the main area just to see, because in there, it, the, the bone may have survived. We're not sure. But it, it is a large site, and, he was, and Mike was finding stuff in the past that is rare for Clovis. And so it'd be, uh, we would actually add to the history of Clovis. But he's done a lot now to add even more to the history of Clovis. So, that, that, so that's coming up, too. So uh, for Pennsylvania, uh, the first people that came in here probably about 16,000 years ago, uh, we would call Clovis, or in some cases they would call it pre-paleo. But if you ever heard of the Meadowcroft Rock Shelter, that's kind of in the Pittsburgh area. Uh, there, uh, I haven't read any uh, recent research, but we do know at, at the uh, layer of 14,000 years, they have a fire pit. At the layer of 12,000 years, they have what we call the Miller Lancelet. And as far as I know, it's the oldest data point in North America. So it's at, so that it's at 12,000 years. That I'm still waiting to get a cast on, uh, because they're, they're a rare, rare point. And they don't look like much. Matter of fact, it, it does remind you of the Cactus Hill point. And so it, it is kind of uh, interesting. Uh, from that point on, they would have been following the glaciers northward. So the, ones that we would, uh, the, the points that we would find up here uh, are probably about uh, 10,000 years old. So we do have them here. And every collector wants to find one. I only found one, and it's OK. <laughs> it's at Connie Lake in a mud pit. Uh, at that time in Pennsylvania, it would have been more of a tundra type location. Uh, Paleo was probably going around in, in large uh, family groups, uh, maybe a couple hundred miles in their rotation. They would have been following the big game herds. Uh, back then, it in our area, it would have been caribou, it would, it would have been muskox, uh, elk, the things that we see a little further north. Uh, they would have been following the uh, uh, they knew when the fish runs would come. They knew when nuts and berries and stuff would be ripe. And they would be there for that. So they, they probably had their migration route. We know that one site, we call it the Shoop site, just north of Harrisburg. The material we find there, that's a major camp. It is Onondaga Chert. That material comes from up near Lake Erie. So we know that Clovis there was probably possibly going down to Susquehanna, then working their way up into the Buffalo area and making another circle back. So that was their rotation. But they have not found their campsite in New York, because in New York, they would find material from southern Pennsylvania. And so it hasn't been found yet. So somewhere up there, there's a campsite. Ones we have around here, we call them base camps. Uh, Geneva Swamp has one. And the reason we call it a base camp, we just find the broken bases of it. Uh, so it's a place that are coming to rearm and go back out to hunt. And as far as I know, the guy that's been digging it, he has not found a perfect point there yet. So we know that somewhere in western Pennsylvania, Clovis has to have a main camp somewhere. We just haven't found it. Uh, we do find good points all over the place, but we don't find them clustered. And that's what we're looking for, a cluster. Um, before we go to break, what I'll do is I'll, I'll go over real quickly some of the new information we have. Uh, on uh, Clovis, we know now that it looks like they are ceremonially hunting. Uh, wool, uh, we do know that we had woolly mammoths and mastodonts. It looks like they are killing one every seven to ten years, and it was ceremonial. Uh, and the way they kill elephants is identical to the way they kill them in Africa. 
Some of the rock, uh, just to let you know too, the Sahara Desert, that used to be a grassland. Uh, during the Neolithic, about uh, somewhere between 10 and 7, uh, maybe 4,000 years ago, we do know the, the planet wobbled on its axis. And now we have the Sahara Desert. <laughs> and so uh, it's wonderful what the planet can do, but we hope it doesn't do it while, while, while we're alive. Uh, but one of the rock carvings, and I don't know if they carved it to make them, themselves look real good, it shows Africans keeping the elephant occupied in the front while one hunter comes up, and I still find it hard to believe, he grabs it by the tail, jumps in the air, has an axe, flint axe, and he cuts the Achilles tendon. An elephant cannot stand on three legs. They're too heavy. And down they go. At the Bowser Road site, the elephant, they, I didn't get a chance to go to that day, but Mike knew he had something odd. He couldn't figure it out. And he started research, because he spent a lot of time in Africa. Just to let you know how, how common the uh, hand axes are, he was out there with a tour group uh, when he used to work out there. And he gave, gave 12 of them 30 minutes to pile hand axes. And in 30 minutes, he had a pile six feet in diameter, three feet high. And that's just from one spot. <laughs> uh, he watched Africans do it basically almost the same way. But the interesting thing is the Bowser Road site, he found the leg bone with the ax cut right at the Achilles tendon. And the interesting thing he found was Africans, the delicacy is the feet of the elephant. We found that the feet of the Bowser Road site elephant were all butchered and eaten. And there's certain stakes along the, the neck vertebrae uh, the Africans like, the Clovis liked the same ones, and they were gone. And so we know they were taken back to camp. And so what they were doing a lot of times was looking for a lone bull uh, in the wintertime, because an elephant needs horrendous amounts of water. And usually the bulls were by themselves. And so they would attack them and kill them the same way. Now, even though he's down on the ground, he's still a nasty animal. So they have to come in behind him somehow and get a spear in here or through the vertebrate. And most of the time, we find it is a point made from it, the elephant from the one they killed before, not flint. It's a bone. Or it's ivory. Then Mike couldn't figure out why all, all these little bones around the pelvic area. So he took them back to his hotel, and he realized some of them were carved. And so he started putting them together. And he found out that they were Atlatls. What they were doing is certain ribs, they were taking and splitting them and making spear throwers out of them. Once they killed their next elephant, they took all the old ones and ceremonially killed them and piled them on, ceremonially on the, the pelvic area. Where the tusk goes into the jaw, it's hollow. They would slice that to make axes. Pelvic area were all the old axes from the other elephant. And also, one of the things they found, that it's only found in Europe, is the hunters would, in Europe, cut the tips off the, the uh, tusks and make a bead out of it. Now, I don't know if it was at uh, Bowser Road or the Hitchcock site in New York or uh, the Blue Lick in Kentucky that we've been digging. They found the same thing. We also know that in Europe, from that round area of the tusk, they would make tiaras. We found a piece of one in Kentucky. And so our Native Americans are doing almost the exact same thing in Europe as they're doing here. And everybody missed it. Mike just found it by accident. The other interesting thing we, we found, we have the two oldest sleds ever found in the world. And they're made from split elephant tusks. And the first one was in uh, New York State, at Hitchcock site. Mike, when he was younger, was digging there. Let's say he was digging here. He missed it. It was right here. <laughs> and so where he was digging, if he would have found it, I don't know if he knew what he would have found back then either. But the interesting thing is, uh, at that spot, and I don't even know how they even missed it. Uh, if you look at the chart, there's a human skeleton there, and it's a shaman. He's got an ant or she has an antler headdress. We're trying to get it tested to see if it's female, because almost in Native American cultures, that would have been a female. Had hor they had horrendous power. <laughs> if you ever watch one of the movies, uh, I forget what it's called, but before the men go to negotiate with the uh, colonists, the chiefs, the women tell them, you do not make any deals till you come back and see us first. That's the power they held. Uh, I think on either side of her, 
Two family members are buried there. Next to her is the sled that she was brought in on, and next to it is the oldest dog ever found in, in North America. It's a big dog that pulled the sled. And it's right near the Salt Spring entrance, so we think that they brought some other uh, ceremonies from Europe, that the entrance to the uh, underworld are these springs. And that's why we think the sled we they found at Blue Lick is the exact same thing. They do have a few hu human bones that they did find, so they think it's another ceremonial uh, burial. And so these things have never been found before here. And so a lot of these salt springs, these mammoth uh, kills, we have to, uh, a lot of archaeologists had to go back and look at it. Also, the elephant that was found in Lake Pleasant, well, a lot of people that weren't told it was surrounded by a ring of rocks, which meant it was held down by a net. But we don't know if the Native Americans, there's no, we can't tell if they killed it. Uh, the bones disappeared. They ended up out west uh, uh, Michigan or somewhere out there. They actually got stolen, <laughs> and that's where they ended up at. We do know that the skull cap was cut off, and they took the brain out. And they probably used it for, for uh, tanning purposes. And a lot of times, they would use the skull cap as, as a bowl. And so that's the only part of the elephant that was uh, butchered. And uh, so why they never came back, we don't know. And so uh, with that, if you want to, you can take a couple of minute break. Maybe has to go use the restrooms. Or if you want me to, I can keep going. <laughs> now, what, one of the things we do know uh, is that when they came over to this country, uh, one of the tools they were using was the atlatl. And so we probably know that uh, this is what uh, uh, Clovis was using. 2,000 years ago, they switched over to the bow and arrow. But for example, the uh, Aztecs, for example, they kept not only the bow and arrow, they kept the atlatl, which is an Aztec term, mean, basically meaning throwing on water. Uh, just like a bow or an arrow, uh, this, this is the bow. Now, for example, if I was to throw a spear from here to that young lady sitting back there, it would probably, I might be able to draw blood, but if I bounce right off of her. With this, I could put it clear through her almost. That's the difference. Or if I was to throw it that way, I could probably reach the house. With this, I can throw it over the house and probably the house behind it, no problem whatsoever. Uh, primitively, the record is with a primitive set, 195 yards. And, but it's not accurate. Now, if you're shooting at an elephant, if you hit it, it I probably would bounce off because I've seen a hide from a woolly mammoth. The leather's about this thick. <laughs> it's nasty stuff. Uh, but a very good weapon, uh, especially at close, uh, close range. They had two uh, types. One was a javelin, which is one piece of wood with a, a point on it. Problem is you had to carry a couple with you because if, if you stuck the animal and it broke, you lost it. Uh, the, the new and improved version was a two-part two dart, the shaft, and then the dart itself. And in dry caves out west, they have found bandoliers of these on a strap. So basically, they could just yank one off and reuse it. Now, how it is used is, now my Seneca friend has told me that uh, more than likely, they did not have three feathers. There's two feathers. And it would make it spin a lot nicer. So when the Aztecs say throwing on water, what happens is when you go back to throw, as soon as you throw, the energy from the atlatl transfers to the spear. You see the spear, if it's flexible, will bend and it takes off and it looks like a wave going through the water. Uh, arrows do the same thing. They bend horribly when you let go of them. And, but you can see the energy transfer. Uh, you can throw this uh, while walking, but you're, you're better off stopping. It basically goes up in the air like so. You do not point it toward the animal. Once you get good at this, your arm is automatically going to throw in the direction you're looking. You don't have to point. And so basically, it's up. You go to throw. And the moment you start to throw, you let go. It pushes forward, and somewhere around here, it, the energy gets transferred, and off it goes. What's nice about these, that when it hits, you're going to hear a thud. This dislodges and can keep going. This falls away. Hopefully, the animal doesn't break it. If you're carrying one or two of them from your bandolier, you can yank it out, reload it, and you got your first rapid fire weapon. They did not have to be accurate. These, these people were uh, very good at tracking. Now, once your animal's down, you have to 
get it butchered. And so there's a lot of times, it depends where you're at. Uh, one of the things you have to have is material. We call these quarry blanks. Uh, if you have an area of material, now this is from the eastern part of the state, uh, Major's Dairy site. It's a manufacturing site. They're bringing quartzite in to work on. So this is a quartzite quarry blank from that site. So I'm not sure where they got the quartzite from, probably Lancaster County. This makes it easier to carry back to camp, because other than that, it's big blocks of flint. So, so at the quarries, they are smashing and then taking uh, stones like a hammer stone. When I pass this around, you'll see there's two little indentations for your finger, and you'll see that the edge is beat. So when you look at it, nature can't do this. Only man can do this. And so it's basically for striking and to make the form to bring back to camp. Once they're back to camp, you're going to make what we call cash blades. Now, this is what they can carry with them. You can carry a number of them with you in a pouch. And a good flint napper, even today, I know flint nappers that will draw the projectile point they want to make, and they'll photograph it. So it's actual size. When they're done, they'll be able to fit it in, inside the drawing that they made. So they got just as good as Native Americans. Uh, but our guys are a little slower. They like to be careful. Back then, they were just hammering them out. The reason why I call them cache blades, they buried these in caches. And they could be 20 or more. Uh, the most I think I've ever heard of is 5,000 in one cache. And they were great big round ones. Uh, that was in a mound, so it may have been ceremonial. So we do find these around here, but sometimes they can fool you. Uh, I, have, I was able to get hold of half of the cash from Conneaut Lake. And the uh, nice thing is, two guys found it. One got one half, one guy got the other half. My archaeologist friend, uh, Carl Birkin, has the uh, uh, half. And then at an auction, I bought the other half. So he's going to come over, and he's got to photograph them all and measure them. But, This is a cache, and it can be small from Muddy Creek. Uh, I start picking them up in the field, but to me, I find one this year, two next year. And what probably happened was the farmer probably plowed them up probably 50 years ago and spread them over a 100-foot area. And after about uh, 10 years of collecting, I realized I have a cache <laughs> and didn't realize it. And so that, sometimes that's how you realize you, you found one but it takes years sometimes to figure it out. Or you're lucky enough, you go through like a guy near Waterford. Uh, the guy uh, goes right along the edge of his property, and they pop out. <laughs> and he's still digging them up. Now, to make a projectile, all Native Americans had to do is carry two tools with them. Base of a deer antler, moose antler, caribou antler depending on what they want to do, the tip of an antler. This is for percussion flaking. This is for pressure flaking. A lot of times when these are sharp, uh, what you have to do is get rid of the edges. This is really sharp, so I'm hoping I don't cut myself. <laughs> uh, by dulling it, uh, the, uh, the bone will actually dig into the flint, acts like a lever, and snaps it off. Let's see if I can make a mess here. So basically, they're going to hold it in their hand. And I'll guarantee a lot of Native Americans, especially if they're working with obsidian, have a lot of uh, major cuts on their hands. And so what you're going to do is start driving flakes off. Just so you know, this flake right here will cut you right to the bone. They're that sharp. And so we do know that no matter what size flake was, depending on what they had to do, you, you can easily uh, skin and butcher a rabbit with this piece. Uh, one about twice the size I can uh, skin a deer with no problem with. They're very, very, very sharp. Then what the, uh, this part is for, if your uh, projectile has a notch, or uh, if you go to your charts, uh, your, your handouts, you'll see some line drawings. Uh, what they are, they tell you a little bit about percussion flaking, pressure flaking. And they tell you about uh, certain styles. A lot of times when it comes to a point type, two could look alike, but they might be 2,000 years apart. But the difference is the way they were manufactured. Some are just hammered out. 
Others are hammered out. Then this is used sometimes going down the edge, take very fine flakes off to make it sharp. Or you just put it in your hand, and what you're going to do is slowly, you're just, you're just going to keep eating your way in, and you're going to make notches on each side of your point. And they just go back and forth, back and forth, they get the notch in where they want it, whether it's a side notch or a quarter notch. A lot of times with resharpening, this is what they're resharpening with. They're just going down the edge, taking very fine flakes off. So if you're on an Indian site, you see big flakes, you know they are making something from something bigger, working their way down. If you see a combination of large to very tiny flakes, you know they are making something and finishing it completely at the same time. Most of the tools up here are made during the archaic period. During the archaic period, there was an explosion of tool types. Uh, we, and the reason why we figured that, the environment is changing. Uh, they're selling down a lot longer, uh, depending where we are in the, in the country. Uh, the, far more food, and so they have time to make more and more tools. And so they could be staying in an area of maybe eight months, but they're not totally staying the full year. Uh, they still have to be slightly uh, nomadic. And so uh, I'm going to combine all early, late, and middle archaic because not much is really changing. Uh, they did live in circular huts. Uh, they could have been covered with bark, depending on how nomadic you are. Uh, like paleo, early on, they were probably covered with hides. Uh, they're still hunter-gatherers. So that means they're still following the big game herds, uh, fish runs. Uh, they knew uh, when the acorns were coming ripe, so they knew all that. And so they would constantly fo be uh, following those. And I think most of the time, they're still in family, large family groups. So it'd be anywhere from uh, mothers and fathers, aunts and uncles, grandparents. So it's a wide range, but still the same family group. But they still needed other groups in their passing so they could have intermarriage and stuff like that. Um, and one of the reasons why uh, we see it, uh, that they're expanding is the deciduous forest is coming in. So that means a, a big increase in nut production, which is uh, uh, highly nutritious. And so, and the stuff can be ground and everything. You can uh, uh, keep it for a while. Also, we are finding, uh, they all had graves, but like Clovis graves are hard to find because they, they moved around so much. Uh, and it's almost by sheer accident you find a grave. Uh, we get to the archaic because they're staying longer. We are finding a lot of them in trash pits, but when you understand the trash pits are organic, and so it's easier digging. Uh, other than that, uh, if it's winter time, your circular hut, you bury them right there. You just dug a hole, bury them, cover it up, no problem whatsoever. And w so when they say that the skeleton was interplaced throughout the village, probably one of the reasons why it was winter time, you're going to dig where it's the softest, and a lot of times it was in your hut because you had the fires in there. Uh, and like I said, there's a, a vast explosion of tool types. Uh, one of the things is uh, baskets like this. Uh, for, hunt, for gathering, you could cook in these things too. And what they did is whatever they're cooking, meat they could cook over the fire, but if it's a plant material, they would put it in here. And if you read about an archaeological dig and you hear about fire cracked rock, what they're doing is they're heating stones as hot as they can get them, putting them in the basket, and that's how they, they cook in it. And so some of the rocks that they could use, I'll pass this one around because it's uh, kind of like what they would heat, round rocks like this. But this is actually a tool, but I want to, I want to show you that when you look at a round rock, you really got to look at it from a site to see if it is a tool. But these were very common for heating and putting in baskets. This is called a molar, and we think it's used for working hides or plant material. When you feel the bottom of it, it's very soft, so we think it is uh, plant material because there's a lot of silica in plant material. And so it polished it right up. I'll pass this around. Banner stones are far more common. Uh, well, on this one, I have like a fake banner stone on it. What the banner stone is, is we found that by moving up and down, it affects the flexibility of the atlatl. So when you go to throw it, uh, the flexibility can actually uh, put more 
energy into the spear. But this is how this would have been tied on. Now for hunting, uh, this is not great. We think, they call them banner stones, we think they're ceremonial. Uh, before you go out to hunt, you might do a ceremony. We do know that they had ceremonial bows and their hunting bows. Their ceremonial bows, especially out west, were highly decorative. And usually the people that ended up with them were the missionaries, because a lot of times the, the, the Plains Indians would give them to one of the missionaries. That's how we see some of them, because other than that, they were buried with their uh, bows, and that would be destroyed. But the hunting bows are far more common. So this is one of the examples of what we call a wing banner. And they're all shapes and sizes. This is one from Brown Hill, Crawford County. This is called a bar amulet. And if you look at it, again, it would be mounted like this. And so it would be far more efficient for your spear, for, for your owl uh, for uh, balancing it out. This is a pop-eyed bird stone. Uh, they made some beautiful uh, atlatl weights. Uh, this is a fake. It was given to me, but it could be real, but because my friend got it, <laughs> uh, he didn't pay anything for it, because everybody figures it's, great, it's a fake. But again, it will be tied on. But we do not think they took these with them, because you don't want to lose these. So we think, again, these were. Uh, Ceremonial, I think most of the times these would have been buried with them when they died. The grooved axes are now coming into play. The first ones are three quarter grooved axe. Uh, they can be all shapes and sizes. A well sharpened axe, you can fell a tree. It takes a while, but you can fell a tree. Uh, the new and improved versions we call the three-quarter grooved axe. The groove goes around, but doesn't go over the top. Usually, if you find these broken, they're broken right at the uh, groove because it's thinner. These you, finally, you hardly find uh, broken, so we think uh, after damaging more of these, they changed the grooving to basically have a more and improved axe. And if mom and dad had their axe, it's more than likely Junior had his ax too. And so it's always interesting when you find smaller versions of things that they all had to learn from somewhere. So it's always neat to see the miniatures. Now this is how they probably would have hafted them. Uh, there's different ways of doing it, depending on what you're doing. Uh, it could be just plant material or it could be uh, uh, sinew, uh, which is the Muscles and stuff, the, 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 like our uh, straps we have going down our leg, they're wonderful for tying things on because as they dry, they get tighter and tighter and tighter and tighter and tighter. And so basically this is how they would have to almost all their tools, whether it's uh, an adze, a celt, an ax, this is how they would have hafted it. <laughs> okay, I'm gonna stop there. Now we are seeing mortars and pestles. I won't send this one around, but uh, they're all shapes and sizes. Uh, some of them weigh about 100 pounds, 200 pounds. You're not moving them out of the field. Uh, they, they become a permanent decoration. Uh, but some of, the, some of the ones that we find in our area, all the way down toward Lancaster, we call a bell pestle. And so probably they were doing it in a mortar that had a big dish in it so you can grind. And what I didn't bring with me is a loaf mano from New Mexico. If you want to understand what, how much grit goes into their diet, a loaf mantle, when they make it, looks like a loaf of bread. That's what we call it. So it's about this big, about this thick. From grinding, when they throw them away, they go from this thick to that thick. And all that grit goes into their food. And so that's the problem with it. <laughs> so that's why some of their teeth we find are, are worn out. Now, one of the groups we find during our cake, we call them the mocha. Uh, their projectile points are found from New York State all the way into our area and then going into Ohio. And so this is what we call the Lamoca point. Uh, some of them are very crudely made, some of them are nicely made. 
Uh, this is getting close to the point where you might see the bow and arrow coming in, but more than likely this is a spear. Uh, we know that at this time point, the climate is getting warmer. It is uh, warmer and drier than it is today. Uh, lodges are starting to become rectangular, so they're getting like the lodges we see with the Iroquois and those people. So they're starting to develop during this time period. Uh, they're about uh, anywhere from 8 to 14 feet wide, about 14 feet to 16 feet long. And a lot of them uh, are two stories, and we think they're storing everything on top, and they sleep on the bottom. And then they have sometimes one, two, or three fires going down the center uh, for cooking and heating. They are still hunter-gatherers, but we do know they depend on fishing uh, because we find what's called net weights. This is a net weight. At Mocha Lake, New York, they found 8,000 of these in a pile. And so what they think they did with them, they made guild nets. They wedged these at the bottom of the net, string it across. Uh, once it's out for a while, they bring it back in, so they always lose these. So that's why they figured they always kept a surplus on shore. We do know they liked, uh, they did a lot of meat drying. They did a lot of acorn cooking. Anybody ever ate an acorn before? They're horrible. Uh, our scouts did it one time. We didn't do it right, but it didn't taste like a good pancake, though. Uh, we have found uh, some of their, their pits can be uh, six feet in diameter and three feet deep, and it's all acorn shells. So they did like to roast their acorns. And some of their drying pits for a fish uh, were immense. They could be eight feet wide, 10, 20 feet long, and about two or three feet deep just with ash. So they're doing a tremendous amount of food uh, preservation. Uh, they're also woodworkers. They probably are making dugout canoes, and their biggest tool that they're noted for is called the beveled adze. Uh, it's flat on the bottom. It's beveled on, on each side, and it's like this. And it's just like the adzes that you see when they were uh, forming uh, beams for barns. Same principle. So they're using fire and chopping. And so uh, they, as far as we know, they're the only people noted for these type of uh, tools. Because once the Lamoka disappear, that disappears. When you're in a field, you can't look on a site, you can't look past any rock at all, because you don't know what they're using them for. This we call an anvil stone. And when you look at it, there's a work platform here. You can see it's been, been pounded out. If you flip it over, there's always a little one. And so we think these were put in their lap, and they could use it for flint napping or whatever else they're working on. But they must be pounding, because this, this dish sometimes gets deeper and deeper and deeper and deeper. There's ones we call pitted stones. And they always have a pit in the center. Uh, we also call them nut nutting stones because nuts fit in them quite nice. And, they, and if you have another one, you can break nuts with them. But we don't know why they would do one at a time when they had mortars and pestles. But we don't know what they're exactly using them for. But the eastern part of the state, uh, when I was working for the Game Commission, we tore out an area that had some hickory nuts in gro grove there. And when we plowed it, guess what we found? Pitted stones. So they kind of go, that might be true. So this is one of the types. But if you find one, if you want to make sure that Native Americans did it, you always flip it over, and there's one on the other side, almost 100% of the time. Or they could be on the sides or the ends. They could have five or six holes. It all depends on what they're doing. There's another one we call a thunderhead. It's the same type of pit, but if you look, there's a drill mark in it. So we think these might be work platforms for the drill. And so if you have a, a gap, once you punch through, uh, you're not going to break the tip off as easily. So we're not sure. Or they could be used for fire starting. But, the, but we know they were using for drilling. And if you flip it over, this one has, actually has two on the other side. So it's one of the ways to know that nature did not do it, but, but man did it. <clears throat> now, there is another one that we call a cup stone. Some of them have larger cups in them, 
but we think these are little mortars. And so it's possible uh, they did grindstone for paint uh, or for medicine, things like that. So we think a lot of these were simply for uh, grinding or if your antler needs some work for, uh, let's say, uh, uh, flint napping, you can put one of these and work back and forth. It's like sandpaper, and it takes out all the rough edges. So that's one of the other things we think they were using them for. Now, usually on them, you might find one on the opposite side, but most of the time, they're only on the one side because uh, they're very specifically using for that. If there is one on the other side, it's very, very shallow. If you find a mortar, uh, I'll show you this one. This one's a little different. Uh, this mortar has its dish on the, this side, but almost the vast majority of the time, if you flip it over, this one doesn't. There's a shallow one here. Uh, so they always use both sides. Uh, but this was only used on one side. The vast majority of them show use on both sides. Now the mortars keep going into the woodland, but by that time, sometimes they're using uh, oak stumps dug out and fired and hardened, and they work just as good. The next culture, uh, now one of the things I will bring up is we do not know if warfare is going on with the Lamoka. Uh, one of the uh, sites that they dug, they found two skeletons and they both had Lamoka style points in them. So either they were executed or they, there, was a, uh, there was warfare going on and it could be village against village. We're not 100% sure. Uh, but we do know that uh, they were dying from Lamoka points. So we're not, we're not sure there. Uh, what, when the next group of people that come into the area are the Brewerton. And that's, they're about 3,000 years ago, to, or 3,000 BC to 2,000 BC. We know that the Lamoka and Brewerton overlapped, but there's no sign of warfare. And so it's possible that if the Lamoka were on the decline, the Brewerton could have absorbed them, because there is no sign of warfare. But there is signs of warfare with Brewerton, because two skeletons that were dug up had uh, Brewerton points in their throat. So we don't know if it was, if it was a warfare or not. Uh, they did have base camps, and so they were relying on fishing, but not as much as the Mocha did. They were still uh, hunting and gathering. So for example, there was 100 or 8,000 net weights on a, Brewer on a the Mocha site, but at a Brewerton site, there was only 184. So we know they weren't depending on fishing as, as much. Uh, harsh were not as common, so we're not sure why. Almost every village would have had harsh for drying, and so they could have been doing it outside camp where you, you might not find it in the camp itself. So that was unusual. Uh, the Brewerton, if you go out into a field today to look for an arrowhead, I would almost guarantee you the first arrowhead you're going to find is a Brewerton. Uh, they made four different types, and they are. Where did they go? <laughs> I know they're here somewhere. Oh, I'll have to look for them. They're in these frames somewhere. Uh, but when you come, oh, here they are. The most common ones you're going to find are these corner notch or side notch. There's little ears. Ears. They made four different types. Uh, probably for uh, they're one of the first groups we run across that have multiple projectile points for whatever they're using. So it's possible they had some for knives, spears, but they also could have started uh, the bow and arrow starting to come in. So it's possible they were used, still using both types. And so you'd have different projectiles depending on what they were using. So we're not 100% sure because they all had the, basically the, the same age to them. So we find out with, with some cultures that they'll make something for a knife or for a very specific job, but they have something else for hunting. During this like, time period, like I said, the uh, beveled adze disappears, but the celt is coming in. So that one celt that went around with the African one, that's typical of the celts. But the celts come in all shapes and sizes. Some are monsters. Some are small. 
the smaller ones, uh, the term tomahawk, I think it's French, I'm not one of them positive. Uh, some of what they were seeing were probably smaller celts uh, embedded in wood uh, and, and handled been very flexible, so when you go to strike somebody with it, the flex does a lot more, more damage. And we do not know if this was a gift or ceremonial, this is a baby celt. <laughs> so we don't know what it was used for. It, it could be for a very specific job. It could be for a uh, gift for a newborn. Who knows? Uh, but we do know when, uh, at, at times, some, some, some of the different uh, Native American groups did give stuff to newborns. So we don't know why. This is one from New Jersey. But my friend had it, and I thought it was cute. Uh, some of the mortars and pestles are changing. Uh, they're grinding things a little differently. Uh, they could already be starting to use hollowed out logs, whatever, but now we're finding uh, very long or roller pestles. And some of these go to about this long. And if they're like this, they're probably grinding it up and down. So we think they're using uh, hollowed out logs for it now. Uh, so this is, I, did, I had to cut back on the weight a little bit, and so I bought one of the smaller ones. But if you look at it, you can tell that they were using both ends of this. Also, one of the tool types that comes out, and it's possible they were using the gouge. It's just like the woodworking tools we use today. Uh, this is actually one that's probably worn out and they threw it away. Uh, they could use this, like the beveled ads, for woodworking or making a dugout canoe. And so, it, uh, but by this time, the Bruton could be changing to the birch bark canoe. Somewhere along the line, they're changing. And like I told some, some people that uh, the Brewerton didn't disappear. We think they became the Senecas. Or the proper name is Haudenosaunee. Uh, you do not use the term Iroquois, even though it's a nice term. It is a derogatory term uh, to the Five Nations. And it was come up by the Algonquin, who did not like the people we call Iroquois. So they came up with the term Iroquois, which means basically lower than a snake's belly. <laughs> and so this. Uh, lower than a snake's belly. And so the Seneca would be first Seneca or Haudenosaunee. <laughs> so I'll pass the gorge around. Now they're also making plummets, just like our plummets are today. Not sure what they're using them for. They could have used them like we use plummets to get a straight line because in some cases fortified villages are coming up, but it could be for fishing. We do know that the group we call the red paint people uh, up in uh, New England, they made beautiful uh, plummets. And some are about this big, wonderfully made. But we do know for some reason that they're about 7,000 years ago. Uh, they had the capabilities of going out to the ocean because in their, in their trash middens, we find sailfish. And I don't know what kind of fishing line they were using. This they can get them to the surface and spear them. But we do know that they were using plummets for fishing. And so they had the. We, nobody's ever found a boat, so they had to have something to get out into the ocean to go after sailfish, which makes it very interesting. Now, some of these could be used as bolas, because when you tie them together in, in uh, groupings and swing them around your head, uh, Native Americans were using them. And they're wonderful if you throw them into a her, uh, flock of geese. You'll, you'll definitely bring down one or two with a flock. Or if, you, or if you're on ambush, you could try to tangle up a deer's legs. So we do know they're using bolas of some type, but most of the time we usually find them around rivers. So we think they're using them, or using them against waterfowl. The next group we call basically a transitional period. I have to go real fast. We're getting close to eight. Uh, in Pennsylvania, the a transitional period, the archaic people are now starting to work toward the, the river systems. Uh, the Allegheny River, the Susquehanna River, the Schuylkill, the Delaware. The Juniana, they're starting to work toward these. They're highly navigable. They're doing far more training, uh, training with other groups. And so the Broad Point people seem to, we call them the Broad Point people, seem to be spreading out all over Pennsylvania, going south into Maryland. And they made beautiful points. Uh, this is a Lehigh Broad Point. Uh, they're all basically big and broad. Uh, and the thing that goes along with them for some reason is soapstone or steatite. Uh, the main quarry is on the Lancaster-Chester County line down near the town of Christiana. And so 
they were making cooking vessels. And some of these cooking, I have a fragment of one. I didn't bring it because it weighs a lot. Uh, some of these were 100 to 200 pounds. And so the only way to move them is by canoe. And so, but then they have to trade them overland. So not sure how they're doing it, but they made them in all shapes and sizes. Uh, steatite is wonderful for, for carving. Uh, I'll pass this around. This is a fragment, a very nice bowl. This is a quarry pick. This is what they've been using uh, to scrape it. Uh, I asked you not to scrape it, but if you run your fingers through the stone, you'll find out why they call it soapstone, because it does feel, feel soapy. But if you look at this pick, and you look at the grooves, they do fit in. And so they make these in all shapes and sizes, depending on what design they want, and they're basically just using them as a gouge, and they're scraping. And I'll pass around a smaller bowl. Normally they have a lug on this side and a lug on this side. Uh, this one's unfinished, but it's finished enough for somebody to use. Now imagine this 20 times this size. That's what they're making. So it actually took two people, one on one lug, one on the other, to pick it up and move it. But they were putting these on hot coals, and this was the first pottery they started actually using. They're still using baskets because not everybody had these. And I'll start passing some of this stuff around. Uh, from soapstone, they were making beads for decorations. Uh, this one is actually a miniature. It's probably for a necklace, but this is what the pots look like. They were about 100, 200 pounds, but this is just a miniature one. So this could have been for the kids. Who knows? They might have been playing. And then this is a bird head bead. So nice thing about soapstone during this time period, they were using it for everything. And it's very easily carved. The next, time, uh, next area we're going to get into real quick is the, the woodland. Uh, the difference when we talk about the, the, the transition on the woodland, there is not much. But the villages are starting to change. Uh, in early woodland, they're not getting it organized into the tribes we know today, but it's getting close. Uh, we still have semi-permanent uh, villages. They're still along the major river systems. The only thing they might do is move about every 15 years, but they may only have to go five or 10 miles up or down river, and most of the time it was for firewood, or the ground gave out. But they weren't really farming yet, but usually, uh, one of the things that they did run out of was firewood because they weren't cutting trees down for firewood. They were gathering up uh, dead stuff for firewood. Fired uh, pottery is now starting to come in, and it's coming in from the south. So some, some of the uh, drawings that you have there of villages and stuff, if you go down the line, you'll see a rough idea what Paleo looked like, uh, what some of the transitional villages looked like, what uh, 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 woodland villages look like. And, the, and if we take the, uh, look at the woodland villages, they actually uh, improved upon themselves very, very uh, uh, quickly, especially when you look at the lodges. Um, we're seeing more burial ceremonial coming in. Uh, they're actually forming cemeteries. Uh, now, for our area, we are influenced by people we call the Adena, the mound builders. They were here, probably trading. Uh, this is a, a, a Dina point, it's called a Robbins. The Dina had all shapes and sizes of points, uh, from about this big, <laughs> uh, narrow ones, uh, bases that looked like a beaver's tail, so they had all types of them. Some were knives, some were spears. Uh, smaller ones could be used for arrows, because we think they had the bow and arrow. And the big, large ones were for ceremony. At a dig we did along the Mississippi, it's a Dalton site, it's a very old site. Uh, in the railroad cut, which they didn't think anything was left there, by accident, somebody was digging and they found two blades about this big. And we do know uh, from other cultures from uh, the future that these were ceremonial because one was pointing in one very specific direction and the other was pointing in the other. And they do know that one stood for male and one stood for female. And so they're dug up for a ceremony. When they're done, they're ceremonially buried. And probably something they dug up every year, but they knew exactly where to dig them up at. And 
And after they sold the site, they found another set. <laughs> so, uh, so it looks like another culture might have came in, but carried on the same uh, ceremony, but made their own. And so it's, it's kind of interesting. Uh, during this time period, too, uh, not only are the Achaic people, are the uh, Woodland people doing it, but the Adena, the Hopewell, they're making gorgets and pendants. And so basically decorations uh, that they would have worn. Some cases, if they are found in graves, they are found in the chest area. Uh, some think they're for other things, but uh, we do know that uh, Native Americans like to uh, decorate themselves. And even when the white man came, uh, the, the metal ones we, we see around the soldiers and stuff like officers, we call them gorgets. Same thing as a gorget or gorget. Uh, they traded for them. And, and so we kind of figured that's what these are. Uh, the pendant came, let's see. Yeah, the pendant came last. So this was first, this is second. So they, they improved upon what they were wearing. Smoking pipes are coming in too because with, with them, uh, when a, I forgot where it went to. But the Hopewell are coming in. Uh, they have very specific point types. You come up here later on with the frames. You'll see one called the Hopewell, one called the Snyder. Uh, they're basically big blades. We think they're knives, but they also made smaller ones we think are bow and arrow. The smoking pipes are, the first ones are stone. Uh, this is a stone one and a steatite one. So they're both stone. Uh, one's a little platform pipe. We think what happened is uh, they drill a little close to the one side and changed their mind. They drilled two holes through it and made a pendant out of it. Uh, this is an Adena tube pipe. This is found in Wyoming County going toward the Poconos. They found a cache of these in the state of Delaware. And they're usually about 12 inches long. And so we know that the Adena were trading for things in Delaware. So they're probably trading for stuff from the ocean. And so they're running stuff back, back and forth inland. But this one was broken and repolished, re and they were still using it. And all I had to do was stick a reed at the end, a tallow, and smoke it. <laughs> Uh, these are two other pipes. If you look at the one on this side, there's a face carved in it. Uh, this is one we call Ford Ancient, so it's a newer pipe, but it's all stone. Uh, this is very uh, common throughout our area, but when clay comes in, they made horrendous numbers of clay pipes. And we think when some of the kids got to puberty, if dad had his smoking pipe, the kids may have had their smoking pipe. But probably only when they be, uh, probably for the males, it may have been around 13. And so, as with almost everything, if we see nice sized ones, we always see the miniatures, so we do not know. <laughs> Did they smoke tobacco or something? Tobacco their tobacco. Uh, if everybody would smoke their tobacco, you'd be a lot healthier. Uh, the leaves are only about this big. Uh, my Seneca friend, I'm, I'm hoping, he says he's going to give me some seeds and I'm going to grow some. Uh, he did say it's good for sinuses. I have tried it, uh, just like inhaling the smoke, and it does work. <laughs> and so there is an ad from the 1500s I saw one time that shows all the medical values and the healing properties of tobacco, but it's their tobacco, not the stuff we have today. Theirs has no nicotine, no tar in it whatsoever. So, and it's, I think it's a biannual, but, or it's either biannual or it reseeds itself. And uh, so it is kind of interesting. Matter of fact, if you, ever, if you go to the Fort LaBeouf uh, in the garden section, I think they're going to grow some this year. So you might see it there. <laughs> uh, real quick, I'm just going to go through some things and get into, uh, into the historic. Uh, during this time period, too, our agriculture is coming in. So when you get to the middle woodland, Late woodland, agriculture's full swing. Corn is coming up from the south. Pottery came up from the south. And the pottery here uh, is fire clayed. That replaced the soapstone. Uh, the one that's decorative usually signifies a tribe. Uh, the plain one is usually something that they cooked in, uh, even though they could cook in all of them. But they're highly decorative, so I think the plain ones were more for cooking. Uh, for digging, there's all shapes and sizes of stuff. They could use wood. They could use antler. Uh, you might find a flat rock, but if you look, it's been curved, and you'll see flakes taken out of it. It's been polished. 
This would be hafted for digging. 